Karibu AMG Realtors. We have specialized in selling of land across the country in areas like Nanyuki, Naivasha, Nakuru, Juja, Kagunda Road, Malindi and the Abadeas. Contact us today for land investment solutions and have your title deed delivered within 60 days upon completion of payment. SMS AMG to 402 or call us on plus 254-748-229-941. AMG Realtors, we don't just deal in land, we deal in value. Thank you so much, Catherine, for being on the We Don't Play podcast show today. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. It's it's. I'm excited about this topic. You know, this is the time everybody is looking for new businesses, especially after the rise of the pandemic. And people are like, oh, we didn't know this exists. We didn't know this happens in real life. So I feel like you're going to bring a lot of value to the table and change people's perspectives. That's what I know for sure. That's really cool. I, I hope I live up to that. <laughs> I know you will. I know you will. You know, to get us started, you know, let us know who you are. You know, what do you do? And just give us a backstory of, you know, how you got into e-commerce, you know, as a whole. Sure. Um, so my name is Catherine Smith. I'm the founder of Walton Birch, an e-commerce consulting firm based in Marietta, which is outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of the Black Lady Business School, which is also based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, prior to being a full-time entrepreneur, I spent about 10 years in corporate America in various roles in communications and training and marketing and social media. Um, but I actually started out as a web designer. Uh, and kind of uh, evolved from there into those other positions. So web design is where I started and web design is kind of how where I landed um, when I decided to go full-time entrepreneur. Um, I guess I'll say that uh, I started, I went full-time entrepreneur in 2019 as a marketing consultant, uh, but COVID had other plans. And so um, due to kind of the pandemic's impact in my local community, I fell back on web design uh, as a way to help out some of those small businesses in my community, but also as a way to kind of make ends meet. Um, and it, it's really been rewarding. And I, I made the pivot after that to say, yes, I, I would love to stay in this e-commerce space and really help people to uh, uh, start and launch and grow online businesses and e-commerce websites and so that's how I ended up in this space amazing you know one question I wanted to ask is the web design piece was this self-taught or did you go through a training or was there because there's usually a story to it <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely a story. And, uh, you know, I tell people that my life has been extremely random, and that is no less random than any other part of my life. So um, prior to becoming a web designer, I think I had been like a marketing assistant. I had only had one other job in marketing, period. Um, and that was because a very small company that worked, uh, that is here in Georgia gave me the opportunity to grow into a role in marketing. So I started in customer service and was promoted into a marketing assistant position. So I kind of parlayed that <laughs> into an internship in web design. <laughs> I like that. Um, for uh, a, a major company and actually basically learned how to design websites as an intern. Um, and I recognize that that is a very rare opportunity. Nowadays, like you pretty much have to be able to do the job before you you can even become an intern so that wasn't common back then for sure and um but it did give me the opportunity to learn how to build websites and not just learn how to build websites but build them at scale like we i would build several websites in a day just like we were just cranking them out um and so that's that's how i got familiar with web design base the basics of web design a little bit of color theory and how things work on a website and then also how to build websites very quickly <laughs> Wow. So it was a little bit of luck um, and a lot of uh, kind of on the job training, I guess I'll say. That's great. You know, when I when you said very quickly, sometimes I wonder when you think about a website, sometimes people say, oh, this website will take you 12 weeks. And then you'll be like, now nah, we'll just do this, crank it out in 12 hours. You know, so <laughs> what's the difference? <laughs> Well, so I definitely think that, you know, there's definitely a spectrum. So there are, you can make a website as simple or as complex as you want to make it. 
Um, and so a lot of people are going for, you know, kind of premium quality value, um, optics, you know, all of those things. And um, I, I, I understand that, you know, like I think at a certain point in business, like the expectation to do that makes a lot of sense. But the, the, a lot of the people that I work with are just starting out in business. They may not have any branding, they may only have one or two products, or may, they may not even want to have more than one or two products. Um, and they definitely, uh, you know, are not uh, well established enough to kind of go all the way out on a website. Uh, and so for beginners, I don't, I don't recommend doing some of those massive website projects unless, of course, you know, like you're creating the next Tesla. I don't even know. I tried to, think, <laughs> I tried to think of a, a company that would warrant, you know, a massive website project. But basically, if you're creating a project that has like a ton of traction from the beginning and you're already getting, you know, um, venture capitalists and investors to the tune of several thousand or hundreds of thousands of dollars, then it kind of makes sense to spend that much money on a website. But for the average person that I'm working with, these are entrepreneurs, these are individuals or solopreneurs, um, people that may be new to business altogether um, or new to virtual or online businesses. And so there's a lot that you learn uh, in that kind of first year of business that makes, um, you know, spending a lot of money up front uh, a slightly risky venture. Uh, and, you know, I tell people, even personally, when I started my business, I, I had an idea of what I wanted to be as a consultant. And COVID had other plans. And so within the first year, I did a little bit of rebranding and pivoting in my business. And so, you know, I did my own website. I did my own business cards with, you know, like one of the really super cheap business card places. And so <laughs> when I had to redo the branding, I was like, okay, well, I've only spent, you know, $40 on these business cards. And that time that I spent to build the website, it wasn't a tremendous loss. But I think for a lot of people going into business, you know, like until you know, okay, this is what my branding is going to be. I'm going to invest in, you know, getting some solid branding, maybe trademark, you know, that intellectual property associated with the branding, then you definitely want to kind of keep it light, I think. So yeah. to answer, to actually answer your question, the difference between the super cheap, let's get this website started uh, projects, not super cheap, not just super cheap, but super cheap, super fast, let's get this website started projects versus those. This is going to take, you know, 12 to 16 weeks and you know, a bajillion dollars uh, is the, you know, like, what are the stakes, basically? Are you established in business? You know, do you have, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of investment money kind of riding on the success of this business? And, and I just don't think that that's true for the average person. Mm, that is so true. And even with small business owners right now who don't have a website and, you know, you had the opportunity to literally bootstrap your business because you had that opportunity but for some like you said it's not it's not opportune for them now so how does someone that is starting their business let's say they just have a shopify store just let's keep it basic a little bit and they just want to sell their t-shirts they just want to make mm -hmm. ends meet and they want to just understand okay i know there's seo involved but that's a whole different discussion but how do they start small so they can scale big that's a great question um, and a question that I get a lot. Uh, so I think the conventional wisdom that people have is if you build it, they will come and true and not true. Uh, so if you don't build it, obviously they won't come, <laughs> but you have to do a little bit more than just build it to kind of bring people in. I'm a huge fan of Shopify. Uh, you, will, you will learn that about me, that I'm a huge fan of Shopify. I think, um, you know, for the price, for the what you get with the subscription for Shopify, it's really just a, a huge springboard for small businesses or someone wanting to launch into their own business to have everything that they need to be successful in business. That said, uh, building the website is, half, is only half the battle. So you build the website, you make sure that you have some excellent product photos. You make sure you have really solid product descriptions and like meta descriptions that are filled with keywords and things like that. And those types of things help to start bringing in traffic to your website. And then you add on to that kind of email marketing, which is built into the Shopify platform, which is wow, it's amazing. Um, and then that helps to capture some of those people that are coming to your website. So you build a really good looking website that has some keywords in it. So it's bringing in people organically. Also, it has enough content in it so that when people come to your site, they're excited about what you have to offer. And they say, wow, this is really cool. Well, maybe I don't want to buy now or, you know, maybe I do want to buy now, but let me sign up for that email list. 
the list is really important part of e-commerce marketing. Anyone that says email is dead is nuts, they're crazy. Uh, that is absolutely not true. Um, I think it's one of the most powerful tools for an e-commerce website. And so having that um, you know, really well-built, attractive website, really good, you know, strong product descriptions and pictures and the keywords is the first part. And then being able to capture the information on like an email list or something like that is the second part of that. Uh, so keeping people engaged, like bringing people to the website, giving them something to be excited about, and then keeping them excited. I think. Yeah. And Shopify does that extremely well for like a very low subscription. So I'm a huge fan of Shopify. That's amazing. Thank you for clarifying that. You know, one of the things that I'm now thinking is when you said email list, right, is I think there's a fact that for every subscriber, their their, their value is about $40. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's like the worth. I mean, I don't know. I'm just guessing. <laughs> Yeah, it depends on the product. So, like, if you sell products that cost a dollar, <laughs> you may get up to that point. Um, but, yeah, like, I think it depends on the product. So, if you're selling, you know, a high-ticket product and then each purchase is obviously over $500, then your average order value is going to be higher than 500 you know, than $40. Exactly. But, yeah, for people that sell just regular consumer type products i think a good they call it aov an average order value then yes this is one of the metrics that your shopify dashboard will show you or kind of keep track of for you um is that average order value and so yes to your point one of the things that you will notice is that the average order value for people that just kind of land on your site from organic search versus people that kind of come to your website from social media and the people and compare those to the average order value for um, your email list they're usually significantly different with the average order value for the people from email being much higher um, generally because they're like friends and family and people who are already interested in your brand um, and it's a little bit easier to market to them quite honestly I think so too because you've already made a transaction through email whether it's because it's mm -hmm. not monetary but that is like a close call it's very it's like one step yep. closer to getting that even when you make a purchase from Amazon you need your email address to, to make that transaction so it's it's really big even social media you need your Instagram email address to log in you know goes with Pinterest and other platforms so email is like the one key that we kind of underestimate most times when it comes to e-commerce which I think a lot of people overlook and that also now brings me to a point where you know when it comes to unsubscribing which is kind of like the back and where people don't really like to say like why did this person unsubscribe i heard that it is better for you to maybe once a year maybe biannually get to ask them if if they are not interested in our emails they should unsubscribe or filter out your audience or we're going to delete you is that something that should be done professionally or that is an overlooked assumption Oh man, you ask one of like the polarizing questions. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of considerations and this this is just my personal opinion. Like I am not, you know, like I'm not even going to pretend to be the foremost expert on this. And I understand that there are a lot of perspectives on this. So just to kind of situate you with my opinion. So I, um, my MBA is in business analytics. So I'm very much a data girl. Um, data is extremely important to me for making business decisions um, for my business, but also on behalf of my clients as well. Um, and then also I'm an extremely frugal person. <laughs> like, so um, a lot of email platforms, and I'm thinking um, a few of the specific ones would be uh, like Drip or Klaviyo they have starter plans for very small businesses but they basically until a certain point charge you per the number of subscribers that you have so in that case because it's relatively easy you know it's pretty easy to send out an email saying like hey are you still interested um and then also because the more people you have especially as you reach that limit for that you know that entry level email plan you definitely want don't want to carry dead weight um, on your email list. So in that case, like as you're approaching a limit or as you're approaching the, my email list is about to get exponentially more expensive, you know, carrying all of this dead weight. Um, definitely, I would recommend in that case doing some pruning or at the very minimum segmenting it and, you know, to make it to effectively kind of market to people who are more engaged. Um, I, would, I was going to say that there's a flip side 
of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually kind of it for me. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to think. Like, I think that by the time that you've done that kind of pruning operation, it is evident. Like, it is obvious that the people are not invested. Like, this isn't. Oh, I sent one email and they didn't answer. This is. They haven't opened or you know clicked an email in over like 52 weeks. So. Um, at the point where you do that pruning uh, operation, it should be like just evident that there's no more engagement, um, you know, from that particular perspective. Um, and then also, I think uh, just a very, very minor consideration for as it comes to email lists uh, specifically, um, lookalike audience. So if you're using your email list to create lookalike audiences, then you want to make sure that the best list is coming through. Uh, and I think pruning is is really good for that um just to make sure that the the people that are on your list are the most representative part of your engaged audience if you're going to look at use it for a look like audience that's a great point thank you for bringing that up because what i was now thinking too with emailing is you know right into the e-commerce piece is it healthy for you to have an e-commerce store and then have a blog attached to it so that you can display your products or do you just want to flood them with images and tell them to download the PDF? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And um, like, if you have people who are my clients, like they know my clients will not get away from not having content on their website. Someone actually asked me this question yesterday. She said, do I really need a blog? You know, I've heard mixed takes on it. And um, so, you know, it may not be an actual blog where you're just like, hey, you know, hey guys, how are you doing? You know, uh, in the way that blogs used to happen in the early 2000s, but definitely some content on your website. And there are lots of good reasons to have content on your website. Uh, So SEO is the first reason for me Um, from a very super practical perspective. Um, it's sometimes it's really difficult to just add words to your website basically for no reason. So you can add product descriptions and that's really good. That's a good way to put some words on your website. You can create landing pages, landing pages. It's also a very good way to put words on your website. And then aside from that, like in order to keep your, um, website content fresh and keep your website up near the top of search results, like how, how are you going to keep fresh content, you know, in order for that to happen. And so the best ways for that to happen are blogs and or articles. So, um, and a secondary benefit of doing blogs or articles on uh, any kind of website really, but also an e-commerce site would be thought leadership. So people want to hear from you. They want to, you know, hear how you're different from other brands. They want to see the faces and the, you know, the, the people behind the business. They want to understand how your products are made and, and what the philosophies of the business are. So you have an opportunity to create relevant and current content that helps with your search engine rankings. But you also have an opportunity to be an expert in your field um, and connect with your audience, you know, as an expert, but also as the, the passionate person behind this business. So 10 times out of 10, 100 times out of 100, I'm going to say yes to a blog or some sort of articles on your website. Like, I will always say yes to that. That's true. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned the SEO piece and thought leadership because... That also puts your product listings and your images, which you've you know added your alt text and all that good stuff to your blog. And when you send it to your email, you're also creating that referral list, that referral link building, which is also essential for your business. But there's one thing that I notice a lot of e-commerce small business owners that start don't think about, which is the return policy page, the terms and conditions, the privacy policy, um, shipping, you know, all those policies. They don't know where to start. They're like, I can't copy this person's website, so how do I start? <laughs> so how, how do you tackle that for someone who's just starting? That's a great question. And another reason why I love Shopify, so Shopify has policy generators for those big important policies. Um, so cookie policy, privacy policy, there's one more, I wanna say terms of use or something like that. Um, I think you have to come up with your own shipping policy, but there are lots of examples of what that looks like online um, because Google will definitely penalize your site if it does not have those policies. Like if Google cannot find those policies, or I guess any really any search engine. So if search engines cannot find those policies on your e-commerce website, they're like, mm, this seems fraudulent. We're gonna suppress this in search engine results. 
So I think it's really good that Shopify has an entire page dedicated to policies. And at the literal click of a button, um, you can update, you can generate just very basic forms of those policies. And so um, even really outside of Shopify, I know that Instagram and Pinterest will give you like a flag before you can make those connections through Shopify if you have those policies in place. So extremely important policies. Uh, but in terms of alternatives to the policy generator in Shopify or other platforms, they also have policies generators who I really love friendly uh, just because it makes it super easy to generate those policies um, in like there's a free version that termly is like a freemium so there's a free version of termly uh, and then there's a paid plan so in the free version you can generate the policy and then like link to it on your website but in the premium version like it continuously scans your site and as you make updates which you we will definitely you know do over time It'll say like, hey, it looks like, you know, you're selling internationally now. You may want to consider adding this policy to your website or, hey, we noticed this on your website as well. So I, I, those policies are definitely of the utmost importance for a lot of different reasons, you know, from an informational perspective and giving people, uh, you know, the information on your site, like what they can and can't do legally on the site. Of course, protecting the information on your site, you know, um, discouraging people from doing really strange illegal things on the site but also providing information like how long does it take for orders to ship? You know, what is the return policy? Um, you know, like, are there special COVID precautions that are being taken? Do you ship internationally? Uh, and some of the policies answer things like that. So if you're not on a platform like Shopify, or, um, I think actually WordPress might have one where there is a policy generator. There are other platforms out there like Termly that can definitely help you generate those policies as well. So start there. So Google um, cookie policy, privacy policy, terms of use uh, and shipping policy. And then you can definitely, there'll be some templates. There'll be some good examples that you can use to start uh, creating those for your own site. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. It, I'm sure a lot of people didn't think of that or they did, but they didn't know how to <laughs> because yeah. they, as a business owner, there are so many hats you have to wear and you may forget that, oh, I forgot to update this. I forgot to do this. So it's very helpful as well, you know, for the e-commerce success. So even now that I'm thinking about scaling with e-commerce, how does someone scale with e-commerce if they're thinking about drop shipping, for example? And I mean, like, um, what's the name of this platform? I can't remember the name. Printify or Printful. You know, those platforms that you can just paste and, and go how how does someone scale with those kind of products do they have to switch up their inventory policy or how they you know get inventory how does it work for those kind of businesses that's a great question that's a great question i feel like i could talk all day about print on demand and drop shipping i could i'm gonna try and be succinct i'm trying to get to the point here so for any kind of drop shipping, so there's drop shipping like through AliExpress or sites like that. And then there's print on demand, which is also technically drop shipping. Um, so with sites like Printful and Printify like that. So I'll, I'll address them kind of separately. So it's a lot easier to scale shipping through something like AliExpress because that's just basically adding more products to your store uh, because they're fulfilled externally. You really just need to make sure that basically your, um, I want to say niche, but I, like I, <laughs> I feel like the word is so overused. The, the theme of your store. So whatever your store is about, whatever the, the common theme or trend among all of your products is consistent so that you're you're refreshing and adding new products to your store if it's a drop shipping store with like AliExpress or something like that. Um, so for print on demand, I think it's a little bit different. So ideally, as a print on demand store grows, uh, you know, unless you're just perfectly happy with it being kind of like a side hustle, at some point, you may want to look to taking that offline. And this is business Catherine. This is not like necessarily website Catherine. This is MBA Catherine. I'm going to take my website hat off for a second and put my business hat on. Um, print on demand is great for, you know, people who are starting who may have designs or ideas or want to get started in business but don't have or want to keep a ton of overhead 
Um, it's kind of like selling on a marketplace platform like Etsy or Amazon where there are fees and the costs are really high. So if you're you know, walking away from print on demand, and, and it really depends on the product, but uh, I'll just say a regular t-shirt. So if you're selling t-shirts for $25, on a print on demand website, you're probably making anywhere from like five to ten dollars per shirt, right? But at a certain point, it really makes sense to decrease the cost of that so that you can basically generate more revenue. Um, and so that's when I would um, advocate for going with maybe like a, a local print shop uh, and then either a hybrid version print on demand for designs that are super popular versus like designs that are not super popular and maybe still having that fulfillment part done by that local print shop and uh, where you instead of making you know five to ten dollars per shirt you can like keep a little bit more of that or you know maybe save some money on shipping or something like that yeah. um, unless you're just like it's really intent on having it be a hobby and not necessarily a full-time job um, but once you get into hey we're doing real volume on this and i'd like for this to be a full-time job the margins or the profit on each product is something to definitely consider so if you're getting you know i mean honestly even a couple hundred orders a month and it's focused around maybe one or two designs i think that would be a good time to kind of basically take it offline to a local print shop to say hey can you fulfill these orders for me or hey can i order in bulk and decrease the cost per shirt or decrease you know the cost per item um, you know, and grow my business that way. So that's a slightly off topic, but that's just, um, it's a special consideration for print on demand because the, the company that's doing the printing is taking a cut. So when you start getting into, when you start talking about getting into volume for those types of companies, um, you know, there's some additional considerations. Yeah, that's a good I know one. that was off topic. No, that was, <laughs> no, that was definitely spot on because I think a lot of people don't know the difference between print on demand and you know drop shipping because when you hear drop shipping you're like am i just shipping what i drop like it sounds basic but it's not <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know like, i think people think it's yeah you're right it sounds basic people think it's a very easy thing to do but it's not it's still a store you still have to show up for your business consistently you still have to market your business you still have to make sure that your products are quality products um, and I think there are a lot of people out here that are just drop shipping really random, not very high quality products. And those stores are not going to last long. So if you're getting into print on demand or drop shipping, thinking that you're going to get rich quick, I would maybe challenge you to kind of <laughs> reset your expectations, um, you know, and start building a business. Like if you put time and energy into building a great product, even if that product is fulfilled print on demand or fulfilled through drop shipping, uh, you'll see returns on that. Like you, you, if you put the time and care into it, you will see returns on it. I think, you know, there are a lot of people out here that's just like, I don't care. Once they buy it, I'm going to take the money and run. Then they're not going to last very long. Right. Exactly. You know, that, that just made me think about something right now. Let's say, let's role play real quick. So if you have a hundred thousand, <laughs> let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars and you, that's your startup capital. And how would you divide that money into parts? I mean, like, would you put 25% in marketing, 50% in website design, 5% in logo design, 10%, like how would you split that cash that you would make more and um, you may not break even in your first year but you'd be gaining that momentum within your first financial year so how would you put that into a physical plan that's a great question and I, I hate the answer it depends but I do think it, it depends on uh, what you're selling so if I have ten thousand dollars and I'm starting a print on demand t-shirt store <laughs> I would definitely, or, or I'm starting just a t-shirt store in general. I would consider having it, um, unless it's like a kind of like lifestyle wear or um, yeah, like lifestyle wear, like something very specific. I, I've seen um, people start their own clothing lines, um, but like you're not gonna really start like a clothing line through print on demand. Like there's, there's some challenges to that. Um, so if I were to say, hey, you know, I want to start a t-shirt store, I have $10,000, my first consideration would be, do I want to buy inventory, buy a heat press, you know, like do my own designs, or do I want to do a print on demand? And so that would be my first kind of question. Um, for me, uh, if this is my second or third business, because I already have a couple of businesses at this point, 
I would probably start with print on demand just because I'm trying to basically get a proof of concept. So I'm trying to see how excited people are about this idea before I spend a ton of money implementing it. Um, so I would take lower margins for a while, but also have less cost and no inventory to get rid of by doing print on demand and maybe testing a few designs, reaching out to friends and family, doing you know email uh, marketing and, and things like that to try and, and get some traction, do a big release. So the money, the upfront money spent on that would probably be, to your point, the website uh, and copy for the website and um, email marketing, some email marketing for uh, and maybe a, a press release or two, I don't know. <laughs> okay. And, um, and designs if I need designs. So if I have designs, I don't need to pay for those, but if I need designs, I would pay for them. So those would be the minimizing those that I'm not just like spending too much money and that people are actually interested in what I'm trying to sell because I've seen that go wrong before where people have just built stores and either the audience wasn't there or they just didn't really have the time to build the store. So that would be the first thing. Um, and then marketing, just uh, you know, building that traction, showing up consistently, building the email list out, building out the product list. Um, like there are several kind of single or like like handful of product brands, but for the most part, if you're starting an online store, you need to have lots and lots and lots of products for people to choose from. So if it's not just like a single product brand, I would spend some time building out the product portfolio, making sure that things are in alignment with that brand, maybe creating some content so that people can see themselves in my brand. So marketing would definitely be that second thing once the startup, um, you know, once we were kind of past the startup cost phase to get people interested in on the mailing list and, you know, in the rotation or in the funnel to buy the product. And then I would probably invest in expansion. So if I notice, okay, hey, like I have five designs and one of them sells 90%, you know, one of them is responsible for 90% of my sales, then that's the that's the one design I'm definitely gonna then consider taking offline. So how can we, you know, decrease the cost associated with this? How can we grow this line? Do we do it in new colors? Do we do it in new sizes? Do we expand to new markets? You know, how can we kind of take a step up to that next level? And, and what are the investments involved with that? I don't feel like I answered the question very well, but it, it definitely depends on the type of business. Um, but more broadly, let me think here. So broadly, uh, definitely startup costs. So how can you create a proof of concept or how can you find out if people are interested in what you're selling uh, for as cheap as possible? Like for as cheap as possible. Don't go out and build a whole app if, if you have an idea for an app. Like how do I create a mock-up of this on the web? Um, you know, like, or how do I do focus groups or something with this? So how do I get that proof of concept? How do I find out if people are interested in, in this in the cheapest way possible? Um, and then marketing, market, 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 market. Um, and then grow, grow the mailing list, grow, you know, the, the, the client base or the, the customer base in ways, in channels that you own. So social media is cool, but it's still very difficult to market on social media and you don't own it. So the own channels would be your website, your owned website, like not not a not a Etsy or an Amazon. So a website that you own on your platform, on your domain, um, and then your email list and things like that. So how can I build up my following, build up my engagement, you know, build up my customers on channels that I own? So focus on marketing uh, and then focus on expansion. Thank you so much for that. Ex yes, that was really good. That was really good. I think. One of the, the major questions, because I have two more questions, and the, okay. the, the one would be, how do you grow your email list? Because there's always... That's this, a great question. You, you know what I mean? Because there's so many ways. Some people buy email lists. Some people do lead generation campaigns. Some people do them organically. Some people use blogs and then wait for the sales to drop. So how would you scale and build your email list from scratch? That's a great question. So the number one thing, obviously, is having a way for people to sign up for your email list. And I know that sounds super obvious, but like just notice sometimes when you go to websites, like either there's a tiny little sign up for the website somewhere near the bottom that nobody's looking at, <laughs> right. you know, or, um, you know, like they're they don't ask or you know the pop-up pops there's a pop-up that comes up two and a half seconds after the site loads and like you're like i don't even know anything about this brand to want to give you my email address 
So definitely be smart about when, where, and how you, how you capture that information. So make the ask, number one, um, but also be smart about it. So for e-commerce websites, I usually recommend a pop-up um, since, uh, you know, pop-ups are like things that like move on a page and get people's attention, but not right away. Like do not load a pop-up at the very beginning because like very few people, unless they were already coming to your site to sign up for email, are gonna fill that out right away. Uh, so let them scroll down the page, you know, let them navigate to a couple of pages and then, you know, as they're scrolling back up to the top of the site or as they reach the, you know, the, the landing page for your signature product, then that pop-up comes up and says, hey, As much as sign up for our email and, and you know learn the products or jobs or learn or become a, a VIP insider or you know like hear more about our products. So make the ask, make the ask intelligently for sure, um, and then uh, be consistent with your emailing. So word of mouth is still a very powerful, and I think a lot of people. I'm always surprised at how often people share emails with other people. Um, so for my other business, my second business is Black Lady Business School. And so we have people on our mailing list. And sometimes I notice that, you know, like we'll get responses for things from people who are not currently on our mailing list. And be like, oh, hey, somebody forwarded me an email about this. I'm like, oh, that's a thing. People forward emails a lot, uh, you know, especially for like service based businesses and things like that. So never underestimate, you know, the value of people sharing that content. So once you capture their information, make sure you use it wisely, keep them engaged, provide value through those emails. Um, and your the people, your customers, your clients, your subscribers will show that will share that information among their networks as well. Um, but always just always be promoting whenever you're out, just say, hey, sign up for the mailing list. You know, whenever you're doing lives, like, hey, you know, go to the website, sign up for this or you know, offer downloads or, you know, offer premium content that kind of goes behind that, but just consistently remind people like that, hey, there is this mailing list and there's additional value that's not even here that's on that mailing list. That mailing list is a valuable mailing list. And like, don't spam people. Like they have entrusted you with their emails. Like you have earned that trust, you know, like you, you Treat it like it's it's sacred, um, you know, and make sure that you are providing value and that you're not, you know, spamming them, but you are you are reaching out to them consistently as well. So if they only hear from you once a quarter, maybe like let them know up front that they're only going to hear from you once a quarter. Um, but at the very mi minimum, I would say reach out to people, you know, once a month, once every couple of weeks, if you're busy, like, you know, I've seen people do weekly mailing lists, but like, <laughs> ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Um, you know, to reach out and provide value, to reach out and say, you know, hey, thank you for being on the mailing list or like, hey, here's how we got started or hey, let's tell you a little bit more about our signature product or hey, let's go behind the scenes of our signature product or hey, here's how we've helped people, you know, um, just connect with people on a personal level uh, and they'll be happy to share. They'll be happy to engage with you in your content. They'll be happy to share the content with other people, you know, and keep coming back for more. So to summarize, ask, make the ask, and be smart about making the ask, um, and then uh, connect with them consistently and meaningfully. That is great. To that, grow, yeah, to grow it, yeah. That is great. You know, I love the simplicity of your website, by the way. It's very straight. Schedule a consultation. I know. <laughs> And we will take it from it's there. It's a web builder's <laughs> website. It's that I'm really busy building websites for other people, so I only touch mine like once every two months. So like, Trust <laughs> me, I feel you. I, I just I, there's so much I want to do with it, and I, I just find myself being really busy. Like I'll do something really cool on someone else's website, and be like, "Ooh, I want to do that." Like, you know how people have um, TikTok drafts? I have web page drafts. <laughs> <laughs> It's almost time for me to hire someone to do my website, honestly. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> we'll be here for you. We can always do that together because, you know, we also have that service as well. So that's the whole point of podcasting. You never know what's going to happen. So, you know, because when you help other people, we always forget about ourselves. It's so weird. It's like we do everything for everyone, but we're like, oh, you forgot to wear your shoe. But <laughs> you're running miles <laughs> for other people. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Yep. <laughs> I know what you mean, but this is this is so great, and I'm so glad you're able to give us so much insight on how to you know connect with people and you know build e-commerce stores as well for people. If there's one thing that you want to leave with the listeners that they can take home 
and just take heed so that they can be better at what they're already doing, what would that statement be? Well, that's a good one. I think two things, uh, and there are two things that I say to people a lot, uh, because as they're entering into e-commerce specifically, they're usually not sure. They're like, is this going to work out? Like, is this going to be worth the investment? And so the advice that I usually give people is you have to start somewhere. You don't necessarily have to, you know, do the whole shebang and the fancy bells and whistles at the very beginning. You can have one page, one landing page with one product and your email sign up list at the bottom. And that's fine. You have to start somewhere. Um, and then once you've started from once you've started, just show up consistently. So add one product per week, you know, update those product descriptions, just stay on top of those metrics, try and get, you know, two or three new people to the mailing list every week. So show up consistently. So start somewhere, show up consistently and you will see success. Uh, I think a lot of people are expecting, you know, overnight viral success. And I don't think that's the reality for a lot of people. Actually, I don't think that's a reality for most people, but I guarantee you, I know from personal experience, I know from working with clients that if you do the work, put in the work, put in the time and show up consistently, it will definitely pay off regardless of whether you are making your own product and selling it or you have a print on demand store. I've seen them both be successful. So start somewhere, show up consistently. Amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Catherine, for being here on the show to tell us everything that we need to know about e-commerce building and just making sure that you have your house in order online especially and you know if there's any way they can connect with you maybe they want to hire you or connect with you or just learn more about your business or maybe tap into your resources and be part of your community what options do they have available Sure. Um, so my website is um, waltonbirch.com. And so that's a really great place to see my portfolio, so book a free consultation with me, some, get some time on my calendar. I'm really happy to review existing websites, kind of talk through options with people. I know this. there's a lot of things to consider when starting a website. So um, going through my website and booking some time on my calendar is a really good way to get started. Um, other than that, I do, uh, well, I do, I say I do. <laughs> I've been so busy lately, but I'm online uh, on Instagram as at KRS underscore consulting. Um, and I've done a lot of uh, basically DIY marketing tips. So wherever you are in your uh, marketing or website journey, there should be something there for you um, and just some resources for how to get started, how to do some of the, you know, like, common and uncommon things that you need to do to do um, to maintain uh, e-commerce websites and things like that. So website, watsonbirds.com, uh, on Instagram as at KRS, KRS underscore consulting. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I know I'll also put that in the description for people and they'll be able to check it out and that way they can have unlimited access to you. Perfect. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I definitely looking forward to connecting with you again. And I'm wishing you the best in everything. And I appreciate you. Have an amazing, amazing day. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome.